Good evening. This evening we're going to talk about vacuum tube technology. Most of you are used to solid state technology, transistors, diodes, and all sorts of chips and LSIs and things. But before that time there was a different solid state technology. And this solid state technology was composed of steel and glass and a lot of metal wires and even some plastic. An example of that is that it would be this tube. This is a 6146 tube which is found extensively in a lot of 60s and 70s equipment. If some of you have seen Radio Shack equipment, most of their transmitters use these, these particular tubes, but so did Kenwood's and so did, so did a lot of other uh, equipment. I'm thinking of maybe Swan and a few other ones. They all used vacuum tubes at that time. The difference between this technology is the current doesn't go through solid materials. There's actually a space between the elements in these tubes. Now in order for the current to be propelled across the gaps between the elements in the tube, there has to be a higher amount of voltage, not 12 or 18 volts. We're talking here maybe 250, 300, or in the case of larger transmitting tubes, you know, 2,000 or more volts. Or like your television picture tube in the old, uh, the old vacuum tube <laughs> picture tubes that maybe had, you know, 20 or 30,000 volts on the plate to pull the electrons up to the screen so that you could make a picture. So anyway, what I, I thought maybe we would start very basically with a simple tube, which is a dual diode. In solid state equipment, you look at a power supply and all you have to do is have two diodes, a transformer and, and two diodes reversed, one on each leg. And you have what we call a full wave rectifier. Well, in order to do this with vacuum tubes, you need to have two plates and at least one cathode, but you can have, you know, two cathodes. The, 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 the tube that I'm going to show you is a 5U4 tube, which is a very standard rectifier. And that's this, this particular tube here. And I don't know how close you can see this right now, but let's look at the clean side of that. If you can see the elements in that tube, those are the plates that you see. The plate receives the positive voltage and the cathode, which is in the middle of that array, and it gives off the electrons, is a piece of metal with a special coating on it. When the coating is heated, it gives off electrons. And then we put a maybe 250, 300 volt charge on the plate and that attracts the electrons. So we get a stream of electrons going between the cathode and the plate. And it's a very simple thing on a diagram. Let me show this to you. Right where my finger is. This V in the middle is both a filament and the cathode of the tube. It's like the diode. When you see the arrow and the line, at the end of the arrow, the line is the cathode. That's the cathode in a vacuum tube. There are two connections to that cathode because that's also the filament. In order for it to give off electrons, it has to be heated. It gets pretty hot. And most rectifier tubes had 5.3 volt have 5.3 volt filaments. And once the, the, the filament is heated up, you can put, you can put the, the high voltage on the plate and you will have a stream of electrons running. And, and being as this is a full wave rectifier, you will have a transformer 
sending AC voltage 180 degrees out of phase, which will energize one side and then the other 60 times a second. That'll give you a 120 cycle pulse, pulse stream. And that will be direct current though by the time it, it's, it's seen at the plate. And that voltage is what ran most of our radios. Now what I've done is I've put, I have put a 5U4 tube, the tube that I showed you in the diagram, on the tube tester. And when you look at a tube tester, there's all of these different settings that you need to make. But that's really not that difficult to do because down in here is a chart. And the chart tells you what those settings should be. It says the filament switch should be set for 5 volts, which is over here. And then all of these have to be set up. Well, they're saying it's the filament, but it's really not the filament. These, these set the settings on the two cathodes. And there is no grid in that rectifier tube, as you saw. There's just one cathode and two plates. So you don't have to worry about that. But we have to set the plate voltage. And that plate voltage is like 250 volts right now. There is no screen. We'll talk about these later, what those mean. And the cathode is at ground, at zero. And the suppressor is not used here. And then there are a couple of other settings that need to be made on this tube tester. There is a bias setting uh, and, and there's a shunt setting. Well, the bias setting is set at zero because there is, there is no bias given in a rectifier tube. And if you notice over here on the right, there is a meter. And I have set the meter. Now it's moved just a little bit from what I had it set before. But you have to make sure that the dial is aimed at that little line up there that says line test. And I'm going to just jack it up just a bit. Because with the tube running and the, and the um, tester having been on for a while, uh, the parameters change a little bit, the current and the voltages thing. So you have to reset that. But when you're all ready to go, like all of these have been set already to the right function, you can push the button that says gas. Sometimes gas accumulates in the tube. And if the tubes get too gassy, you're going to run into trouble. But this is just fine. You notice that goes way down to zero. That's good. Okay, filament continuity. It says it's good. I can tell you that it's good because when I look in the top, I can see that the filaments are slightly red. And when I touch it, I can feel that the tube is hot. So I know it's working. So I'm going to push the test button. Oh, it's going up. It's in the good area. Hey, it's way up in the good area. Sometimes when you test a tube, not only is it in the red area, but it could be just at the beginning of the green area and it's doubtful. But this is, this is reading somewhere around, oh, 20, 23.5 micromoles. Let me explain. Because the tube is not a solid state thing, two probes connected to the same material, you can't measure resistance. What you want to do in a tube is figure out how does it conduct. Well, they came up with a different way. They, they kind of, it was very clever. They came up with conductance, which is the opposite of resistance. You know when you learned Ohm's Law, you knew if you had voltage and current in the circuit, you have to figure out how much opposition to the current there was. That was resistance. In a tube, we want to know with those electrons coming off the cathode and aiming toward, toward the plate, we want to know the plate, which is the anode, we want to know how conductive is it? If it's an old tube and, and the valence electrons and the cathode have worn down or worn out, the emission will be very low. So we want to see what the conductance is. Now, 
this is the thing that's funny. We measure conductance in MOS, M-H-O-S. If you look at that word, M-H-O-S, take the S off the end because that makes it plural, right? And you read it backwards, it's O-H-M. It's the reverse of an ohm, which is resistance. And electronically, electrically, if you, if you, electronics is expressed in mathematics. I mean, everything has some mathematical term or formula for it. So in this particular instance, Mohs is the reciprocal of ohms. So you could take the moles, if it's, if it's reading like it's reading 2300, 23.500 moles, I could put that into a calculator and hit the reciprocal key with the one over the, over the line and it would give me moles. It would change the moles into resistance. But we don't do that. I just, when you look in two manuals, most of the time they tell you what the transconductance reading should be, and this just gives you, like a thermometer, is that tube working up to par? And don't worry if it's working a few moles less or, or more. That's not a problem. As long as it's working is the main problem. Because a lot of these, a lot of these tubes have a lot of hours on them already. You see them at ham fests, okay? Now, this is a very simple tube that we just talked about. This, this simply allows alternating current to go across. It's a full rave rectifier, so they're going to be 180 degrees. The one side is going to be positive while the other one's negative. Well, the cathode's only going to conduct when it's negative. So the other one isn't going to conduct, and it's going to flip-flop and it's going to give you a 120 cycle signal on the other end. And then you filter that out and you've got a nice DC. But these guys that thought of vacuum tubes, they came up with a lot of other interesting things. They found out that what they could do is they could add some other pieces into the puzzle and come out with tubes that did other functions. You can regulate the flow of electrons between the cathode and the plate. If we put a little screen in there and we put a negative voltage on it, as we raise that negative voltage to a certain level, we could stop the stream of electrons going across. And now if we set it at just the right voltage, we could put an alternating current from, for instance, our voice, and we could make that trail of electrons going from, from cathode to plate vary up and down. That's how a vacuum tube works. When it swings more positive, you get more, you get more current going through the tube. So the signal goes up. And then as you swing the other way on the alternating current, which, which a voice would be, all kinds of alternating currents, as it swings the other way, then it would come down and oppose the current coming across. So if you set that right in the middle, you're going to get a little signal going in this way. And since you're putting 250, 300 volts across that gap, you're going to get a big swing in that, just like a transistor works doesn't work the same way, but it's the same effect.